recording. And thank you very much, Hans, for agreeing to give about the SAS seminar, and it's all yours. Thanks a lot, Kate, and thanks a lot for having me. Um, my name is Hannes Mutschler. I am, um, until late 2020, I'm now a professor at the Technical University of Dortmund. And before that, I was a um, research group leader at the Max Planck Institute of Biochemistry in Martin Suite, which is close to Munich. And here I was part of this Maxim Bio Research Consortium, which some of you might have heard of. It was a, a bigger program running for, I don't know, maybe six, seven years, um, which was mostly focusing on bottom-up assembly of lifelike systems um, using non-living components. Um, and we back then managed to get a, a group leader, or I managed to get a group leader position back then and build up a little lab. And we're working on different uh, things. So I'm a biophysicist by training. And for my PhD, I worked on, a, let's say, rather classical uh, topic in microbiology. I tried to figure out what an enzyme does uh, when it kills a bacteria. And the first time I got in touch with SynBio and Origin of Life research was during my postdoc when I joined Phil Holliger's lab uh, at LMB in, in, in Cambridge, where I started working on ribozymes and their activity in weird environments, such as frozen water ice. And then when I came back to Germany, I started my own little lab, and now we're doing a little bit of both. We are working on um, an origin of life questions, mostly with nucleic acid enzymes and funny conditions, but we also do some, let's say, traditional bottom-up bio where we uh, create, try to uh, reconstitute um, fundamental um, processes of, of living systems of modern living systems, not of prebiotic ones. And for those of you who don't know Germany very well, so we are, well, my lab is currently moving from here to here. So this is where Munich is, and this is where Dortmund is. Um, and you shouldn't do that move if you're a, a football player, uh, because there's a strong rivalry between those two clubs. I don't know, some of you might have heard of Borussia Dortmund and Bayern Munich, but as a scientist, it seems to be okay. So far, I have not been, <laughs> and blame for that. But as a football player, this is not well, well received. Okay, and as I said, research interests, half of the lab is doing origin of life research, mostly we're focusing on nucleic acid catalysis, um, ligation, replication, uh, polymerization, all these things. And we put those systems into different model protocells with our collaboration partners, both uh, lipid-based compartments, vesicles, but also membrane-free compartments. And then we uh, try to figure out if this might be a, might have been a suitable environment for the first protocellular entities uh, on early Earth. Um, but we're also looking in different environments, as I said before, frozen environments, but also far from equilibrium environments with, with together with physicists, um, where we try to understand what could have brought about a far from equilibrium character of of living systems. And in general, like everyone in the field, we're asking how, how this first lifelike systems could have emerged under pre-biotically plausible conditions. And if these conditions are something that is robust and might uh, allow the formation of, uh, of molecular evolution also somewhere else, not only on Earth, of course, it's one of the big questions mankind has. And, um, but apart from that, we are doing this um, classical, bottom-ups in bio, where we take proteins and nucleic acids and lipids. Well, we don't take that much lipids because we're not in this part doing lots of compartmentalization, maybe some emulsion droplets. But we take those components and hope that we can build something that at some point might resemble what we believe a, a minimal cell could be based on modern biochemistry. And we are focusing mostly on genetic systems, so DNA replication, RNA replication, also some evolution. Um, and we, we try to build those systems. And I uh, will focus on one of the main projects um, we have done in the last couple of years as, as part of Max and Bio, so not so much about the RNA systems, and we will also not talk about our origin of life um, uh, projects. Maybe another time if I get invited again. <laughs> Um, and um, so th this project is was a kind of a, a starting point, which is something I think a lot of people in the 
field are, are aiming for, which is the reconstitution of the central dogma in a way that you can build a self-replicative unit um, that uses, like modern biology does it, uh, this information flow in biology where you have a DNA that is replicated and this genetic information is transcribed into RNA and then translated into proteins and proteins, uh, um, as you all know, are the main workhorses of, of um, modern biology and they keep the system running next to ribosomes. And um, now this uh, field has already some, quite some history and um, um, in 2006, uh, Anthony For For Forster and George Church, of course, did this first um, evaluation of, of what, might, what might be necessary to build a minimal uh, living cell based on, on this modern biochemistry or on the modern central dogma. And they came up with this roughly 150 genes that would be required to, to build this minimal cell. And it, you know, it already looks fairly complex. This is even like, of course, a simplification. So you have the entire RNA metabolism, where you need precursor RNAs for tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs. Um, of course, you also need to make uh, ribosomes, which is a different chapter for itself, as, as also most of you might know. And you need to charge the tRNAs with amino acids and translation factors, chaperones, and everything of this feeds back into protein synthesis. Um, and the majority, majority of these genes that you have in this, um, let's say, recursive system is actually there just to make the proteins themselves. So, about 96 percent of these 150 genes are just there to make more proteins, and this is something that's very important in modern biology. That um, making proteins is enormously difficult, and you need actually a lot of uh, genes to achieve that. And you know, sometimes when I'm frustrated by that, I go back to our origin of life projects where we mostly work with ribozymes. And then when I'm frustrated by ribozymes, I go back to the in vitro translation systems because at least they can make stuff, but it's hard to replicate them. Um, so, but let's let's uh, stick with, with this topic. So I guess, again, all of you know the pure systems and in vitro translation systems, so I don't need to talk too much about them, but a good starting point of building such a central dogma is, of course, uh, the pure system. It's a well-defined system. You know more or less what's in there, depending how well you purify your components, and it's already quite sufficient to, to make uh, some proteins, maybe not high yields of proteins, but you can produce something. And again, just as a reminder, what's in there, so it's uh, uh, tRNAs, most of the translation factors and tRNA synthetases, ribosomes, so they have been assembled for you by bacterial cells. And again, um, you may use this system to have a minimal kind of uh, translation system. And the first thing we thought about maybe you know, it would be nice to add an extra layer on top of a pure system having a DNA replication system uh, that, that is replicating some of the components of the pure system itself. And the simplest way this would be a DNA polymerase, which replicates, for example, its own template, and then this template gets transcribed, and you make more of this DNA polymerase. And um, kind of when we started the lab um, around that time, there uh, was a the first publication coming out in, into that direction, which is that you can uh, very well do this using a, a phage DNA polymerase, a Phi 29 DNA polymerase. A lot of you might have it even in your freezers if you do whole genome amplification uh, or rolling circle uh, replication channel. You can buy this from different vendors. And what the uh, Jihashi lab back then showed in, in 2050 is that when you have a circular DNA template and you put it into pure system, into an uh, optimized pure system, um, with the gene for the 529 DNA polymerase on there, you of course get transcription. Um, if you have a T7 promoter, then you make the DNA polymerase and the DNA polymerase, even without the addition of any exogenous primers can then start to replicate its own circular DNA template. And the idea is that it uses RNAs that are floating around and annealing to your DNA template. Um, and what, what we see here is a typical rolling circle replication. So you make concatenars of your circular DNA template. And any later works you could also uh, show. So you can make more messenger RNAs and more uh, proteins 
from those replicated DNA elements, but you can also process those concatenates back into circular DNA uh, to a certain extent using recombinases. But I will show you later that this is maybe not even necessary, which was something that's also shown by the, the Ichihashi lab itself. Um, and we asked and the question, uh, we were in the middle of doing this and then uh, we already had uh, some nice results, but of course having one plasmid was not really uh, sufficient anymore. So we were wondering, can we expand this towards making more stuff? Can we uh, replicate something that approaches the size of a, a minimal uh, genome, um, encoding some of the uh, core components of the pure system? And our target back then uh, was a, a bacteria called Nasuya delta cephalinicola, which is a endosymbiont in, in some leaf hoppers, and it has a tiny genome. And back then when I read the first papers, uh, it seemed like these 112 KB you see here are enough to encode for the entire uh, central dogma, because you have a DNA polymerase, you have transcription, and you have a minimized version of the translation system. But now in later studies, it was found that you still have some active um, transfer of genetic information from the host into these endosymbionts. So 112 KB might actually not represent the minimal size of a genome. But then, back then this was our, our, our target and we tried to see whether we can replicate something that has a total a DNA length of that size with uh, heterogeneous genetic information. And back then we did not have any access to a custom pure system. This is a bit different, but back then we only had a pure express system at our hand. And again, so the idea was you add a DNA which encodes for a polymerase, you use the pure system to make this polymerase, and then this DNA gets amplified and you make more of itself. It's more like a virus, not really like a, a lifelike entity at this point. Um, but we needed a starting point, so we had this plasmid which encodes for this 529 DNA polymerase, and we put it into pure system, we added some DNTPs, and we found nothing happened, um, which was a bit unexpected, but we tried around a lot with the normal pure system, adding DNTPs and enough magnesium, of course, that the system would work, but the, you know, the gel is a bit smeared. It's hap it happens when you have uh, uh, plasmids in the pure system, but I, I think you can appreciate that not really a lot of amplification of this plasmid is going on here. And at what, what Kai, the PhD student that was working back then on this project, he left, uh, uh, graduated early this, this year, um, um, actually a couple of weeks back only. Um, what he um, managed to do then is that he used the Pure Express system and then played around with, with the energy mix and also with um, one of the solution that contains the ribosomes and most of the proteins. And he found by, by doubling the effective um, uh, ribosome and translation factor concentration and reducing the NTP concentration, also optimizing the construct further, um, he would eventually come up with a, let's call it a hacked pure express system, which we then call pure rep, where you would then get very nice amplification or replication of the small plasmid, which uh, was uh, back then a big, big relief because we thought we would go nowhere with this project if you can't even replicate a simple single plasmid with, with the pure system. And after about 16 hours, you get a roughly like tenfold um, replication yield in this pure rep, whereas in pure express is actually, this is measured with this qPCR, essentially the things don't really work. Um, and you can even do some serial transfer here. So you take a little bit of this um, pure reaction or pure rep reaction where this p rep plasmid is self-replicating and you transfer to a new reaction of course, then the concentration first drops, but then the system starts to replicate again and you have more of the template and you transfer it again to a fresh solution and so on. And with the serial transfer, um, you can, for some generations, keep the system al alive, if you wish, or you can keep it running. In the end, it dies for different reasons, presumably because there is no uh, selective pressure on the system to keep the genetic information. Okay. But this was a good starting point. Now we had this pure rep system. As I said, back then we, we didn't have our custom pure systems yet. Um, so we could use now, could still buy pure express and then just modify it and then could replicate uh, DNA. And the first question we of course then addressed was 
whether we can grow uh, go bigger. So can we um, not only replicate this PREP system, but also more uh, plasmids? And um, a very interesting set of plasmids, um, which, which uh, was available back then uh, from one of our neighboring labs, and which originally came from from the Forster lab in, in, in Sweden, and by this beautiful presentation from Shepard et al. in 2017, are these PLD plasmids. So what uh, those guys managed to do is that they uh, um, um, cloned all the translation factors of the pure system, but EFTU onto, onto these three very large plasmids, called PLD1 to PLD3, uh, which you would usually use to overexpress the translation factors to make your own pure system. Uh, which works quite nicely. Um, and we thought, now no, when we have these plasmids there, because we then started to make our own pure system, why not only also trying to, to replicate them with the PREP and pure rep system? And um, so the, the genetic load of the system would then uh, grow to about 80 kilobases, um, kilobase pairs. And what we here then did is uh, very uh, simple experiment, if you wish. So you, you take one of the plasmids and you add PREP and the PUREP system. And this is what the reaction looks at the beginning. And what the bands you see here are a restriction digest of this PLD1. And then you do your replication reaction. And I think you can appreciate that after 16 hours, you have more of these specific restriction patterns that you get by digesting PLD1 compared to the reference, which so this proves that you not only replicate your DNA, but it also uh, has um, um, maintained its, its sequence identity. So we checked this individually for this th three plasmids, as a, and as a matter of fact, all of them seem to be replicable with the PREP system in our pure rep mixture. And um, back then we still could do uh, gel assays because the DNA is, when, you know, complex, but not that complex. So we could also run them all together with the peer rep system. And then the restriction pattern gets very uh, complicated, but we could still show by this typical molecular biology assay that uh, we would replicate all these plasmids in parallel to the peer rep system. And then um, that, that was very nice. So we could, you know, it's, it's not limited to this single plasmid here, but we can probably add as much or not as much as we want, but we can add a lot of genetic cargo as well. Um, and one nice feature we observed like back then is that when you do this rolling circle replication, even in the pure system, which presumably looks like this, you have your circular DNA template, and then you have this 529 DNA polymerases, which produce these concatomers of your plasmid. And this actually gets very complicated um, over time because uh, the, rep, uh, the polymerase can also initiate replication on the new uh, product strands and you make those uh, DNA dendrimers and you would think of this as, as, a, as a mess. So, you know, this is probably a dead end product because it's so complicated. But what we found back then is that when, when we take this mess and dilute it and transform it into E. coli, we would get uh, again our circular plasmids back which is actually fairly nice. When you do this reaction with the NTPs, you get colonies. And if you do exactly the same pure reaction, but you leave the DNTPs out, you don't get any colonies at all. So it must be uh, the, the newly synthesized DNA that um, gives you these colonies. And presumably what's happening is that E. coli simply um, um, regenerates the plasmid from these concatomers using homologous recombination signal. That is, uh, <clears throat> to what happens um, during, during Gibson assembly. So you have this homologous sequences and then the DNA repair machinery of, of E. coli just fixes that. But we haven't really tested this hypothesis, but it's probably what happens because what you get out there is, clonal ident is clonally identical to your input DNA. And this is in one way very nice because whatever you have replicated, even over several generations uh, in vitro, we can put back into E. coli and do you, where you have the entire molecular biology toolbox available. So you can, um, you know, you can make it clonal, you can sequence it, you can um, 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 engineer new genes into your, your um, template and so on. And then you can go back in, into the vitro system. I think keeping that door open back to, let's say functional biology or like real, uh, real biology is actually quite helpful uh, for 
uh, for, for further improvements of the system. And um, so we try to push, push the, the boundary further and further by uh, adding more and more plasmids. So adding, for example, a translation factor is missing in this PLD1 uh, system, and also just for fun, adding some ribosomal RNAs or a ribosomal RNA operon, which encodes for 23S and um, also the small ribosomal RNA, um, 16S. And, um, and again, you would then um, here now we have to do this with qPCRs because the restriction patterns get just too complicated, so you can't really annotate uh, the bands anymore. But by qPCR, we, we could show that all of these plasmids are replicated. The bigger ones, of course, less efficiently because they're just bigger, and the smaller ones are replicated fairly decently in, in, a, in a single pot, one pot reaction. And again, we can use this in vivo readout to confirm also the identity. Um, um, of these plasmids by sequencing or restriction digest by um, um, using the ability of the system to that that in vivo you can regenerate the template plasmids and then you can select for the different selection markers that are encoded on these plasmids and then you can verify that all the perhaps plasmids in there and not just this simple amplicon from the qPCR have been replicated. Um, and then you know you try to publish that, and you're happy. And then the referees say, uh, "Yeah, but you know, can you get closer and closer to a minimal cell?" Um, and uh, you know, back then we already wrote that 112 kb is probably the smallest genome you have in a, in a cell. And then we they wanted us to show that also this is possible, even though of course we don't encode all the genes that are part of this 112 kb. But it was just a matter of, of, of length whether we can replicate. Uh, at least uh, um, non-redundant genetic information of that size. So we added more and more plasmids, uh, plasmid encoding for nucleoside uh, um, diphosphate kinase so that they have to regenerate the NTPs, um, creatine phosphate uh, kinase, and uh, also T7 polymerase and so on, adelaide kinase. And um, in the end, we really succeeded in showing that all these plasmids can get co-replicated just by the help, with the help of this tiny plasmid encoding for the 529 DNA polymerase. And here we um, exclusively did the in vivo readout where we transformed this entire mess of, of replication products and then demultiplex uh, the, the content by, by using our uh, shuttling uh, uh, transformation approach back into the in vivo system. And we found that all the plasmids indeed would be replicated, but this is not quantified. So we don't know if, you know, if this plasmid is still doubled or maybe it's just like replicated by 20%. So this is something we have not yet um, uh, shown. Okay, so this, this was um, all nice, but then you know, we also get a lot of these questions whether, you know, you make those, those long concatenators of plasmids, but, uh, you know, are they not like a dead end product? Because no living cells uses, uses concatenators of its own genome to, to survive um, over multiple generations. And probably this is true, but um, for at least a very primitive form of a synthetic cell, this might be uh, maybe enough. And that's something which came out in a nice paper by the Ichihashi lab uh, um, not long ago. I, so here's the reference that I, I already show all the, uh, the, uh, the figures here, but th what, what they did is a serial transfer again of a plasmid encoding for this 529 DNA polymerase. And they used slightly different conditions and they could keep this, this uh, system alive for even longer than we did. Um, so this is again serial transfers. And when you look at this on a gel, you see all your, um, all your DNA species get stuck in the well. So they're so big, they can't enter the gel, meaning they must be really long concatenates. Um, over time, they also lose their, their uh, identity. So the, the, you can transform them back, but the uh, number of viable colonies uh, gets smaller and smaller, but probably again, because the system is not, there's no selection pressure. Um, but the question is, how, how is this even possible? Because you don't have any circular template left. And they came up with this very nice scheme that is called repetitive sequence replication, which is so shown here. So you have a concatenator for the simplicity shown as, as two plasmids that are 
uh, now duplicated. And then you have a normal replication process. And what you would expect is that you get truncated products. And our idea was that when you get those truncated products, um, you have at some point the issue that, um, that you have only monomers left, which cannot replicate. And what seems to happen though, is that those concatomers can self heal by um, annealing in a way that it's not blunt, but that you have overhangs, which can again get regenerated by the polymerase. So you, you, you maintain a certain length of this um, concatomers over several generations without losing. Um, so the, the systems then can maintain the ability to replicate, even though you don't have defined ends and even though you create degenerated products. And in fact, something similar is also what we observed that you, you get, for some reason, you have defined bands that appear and they seem to, seem to contain repetitive sequence information. So rolling circle products, in my opinion, and maybe also other people in the field might see the same is might be okay for the first primitive DNA replication system in, in pure-based replicators. Um, now, having uh, DNA that is replicated, replicating is, is of course quite nice, but <laughs> it's only uh, one part of the coin. The more difficult one is to make all the genes and proteins that are encoded on your, on your plasmids. Um, and to, to address whether we have some regeneration of the protein factors that are on, on some of our plasmids, we made use of a very simple in situ labeling protocol where we have a pure, uh, pure system with existing translation factors for example, from the pure express system. And then you add your plasmids encoding for the translation factors and you um, mix it with amino acids that have stable isotope labels, so, um, arginine and lysine with, with a heavy uh, um, um, nitrogen attached. And what we then found was that uh, when you do this labeling, you of course get uh, the existing uh, translation factors which are unlabeled, but you also have the formation of some um, um, translation factors that have been labeled with the, uh, your amino acids. And then what you can do is you trip and digest and do a very basic and simple um, protein identification. And then you can have a relative quantification um, of your newly synthesized translation factors in the pure system because they, these are the ones that have been labeled with your heavy amino acids. And when we did this for the PLD plasmids without any DNA replication, what we found was the following. So for this PLD1 plasmid where you have, I think, 13 translation factors, mostly tRNA synthetases, uh, we found that you get a very good regeneration, at least using the simple metric here, um, for the expression from those plasmids. So a ratio higher than one means that you have more of your average um, um, peptides in this uh, mixture than uh, you had at the beginning of reaction. So you have about 10 times more of the heavy labeled peptides um, before, uh, and then at the beginning of the reaction, after the reaction before you start the reaction. And for some of the proteins, such as this release factor one, you get a number sm smaller than one, meaning you don't regenerate uh, this protein to a satisfying amount, meaning to the uh, amount it had at the beginning of the uh, in vitro translation reaction. And you can also do this for these other plasmids. Again, this is just looking at them individually. And we see that some of these uh, proteins seem to be regenerated quite well, whereas others fail to uh, come up uh, um, to, to you know, give yields higher than one for this regenera simple regeneration metrics. Um, but you know, this is again uh, here just a reaction that happens without any DNA replication taking place in parallel. So this is, is the real deal of course that you not only make those proteins but you also try to um, um, replicate the encoding genes in the background. And this is hap what happens if you have all these three plasmids in your mixture. You add your P-rep uh, replication plasmid, and then you also add your stable, uh, your heavy amino acids, and then you quantify how many of your genes are regenerated uh, and, and to which extent during the uh, TTCDR. So I haven't introduced this uh, abbreviation before, but this transcri uh, transcription translation coupled DNA replication reaction. 
and you can, I think, appreciate that this first um, set of genes is still fairly well uh, regenerated, apart from those outliers here. The second plasmid now fails completely, and this uh, third plasmid is kind of a mixed bag. So some of the translation factors are well regenerated and others not so much. And this correlates quite well with the approximated concentrations of these translation factors in the pure system. So we didn't have the real numbers because Pure Express didn't give us the real numbers because they <laughs> uh, either disclosed and sometimes even also hard to manage because apparently what we learned is that they titrate the amount of translation factors into your pure batch that you order until they have a certain amount of GFP expression level and then they sell it. So they don't really control for the input of translation factors. They sell it when they have reached a certain amount of GFP expression in your batch. Um, so it's we don't have we don't have like real numbers here, but we have uh, guesstimates based on on other publications and also on the initial um, um, publication of, of pure systems when they were still made uh, non-commercially. And what you can see here is that for this PLD1 plasmid, where you have very lowly concentrated proteins, uh, regeneration works quite well. But for other translation factors, where you seem to use and need huge amounts, so micromolar amounts, which for pure system is a lot to regenerate, that's why when things get really hard. Um, which tells us when you have, um, when you want to regenerate. Um, and translation factors are pure components that are only present in low nanomolar amounts. It's not a problem for the pure system, but it gets really difficult when you need to regenerate something that is present in, in, in several micromolars, in particular when you're in combination with all these other factors which are still allowed, uh, around in the system. Um, and so, you know, back then we, we showed by, by mass spec that you can make those proteins, but whether those are functional or not remained uh, not so clear, at least in, in, in this context. So we had a little follow-up study at the, at the end of Kai's uh, PhD, um, where we try to show that at least some of the proteins we make um, in the pure system can also feed back into the pure system and, and maintain its activity or support its activity to, to a certain extent. And again, what we did here is, is very simple, so no complicated microfluidics because we, we're not very good at it. Uh, so we, we have to do these things manually. Um, so what you do is you have a pure system and then you let it incubate and make your translation factor. And then again, you transfer 10% to a new pure mixture, um, which is missing this translation factor. And you do this for, in, in this case, we only did it for three generations because after that, the system was unfortunately uh, dying. Um, but as a proof of concept, it, it was at least worthwhile uh, uh, showing that it can work. So the idea is again, in generation one, we have your pure system and a plasmid and it codes for your protein of interest, which could be, for example, TNA R a T7 RNA polymerase, a mucosal diphosphate kinase or adenylate kinase. So typical enzymes that are not translation factors, but required to keep it up and running, uh, to keep in vitro translation up and running. And as a negative control, you can add another plasmid, which is not encoding for this essential protein of interest. And then uh, what you do is you, you start your reaction. So this is generation one shown here. You just have this boot up reaction and you make your, your protein. And these are here visualized by um, um, green list labeling. So you add um, a, a certain fraction of a fluorescently labeled uh, uh, um, lysine residues to your proteins, and then you can visualize them on your gene. And in your negative controls, what you do is you, you leave this protein of interest plasmid away, and what happens is that you lose the ability to make your protein of interest because the template, uh, template is disappearing also because your pure reaction is dying. And in contrast, what happens when you have your uh, plasmid with this protein of interest present is that, I hope you can, you can see this, um, uh, quite nicely is that you keep the expression of your protein of interest intact for these three generations. You, it's hard to regenerate 100% of what you had in there. So for some, it works very poorly. After three generations, you only have 50% of, of your uh, protein of interest left, but for others, it works quite well. So T7 seems to be fairly easy to regenerate, whereas others are not as easy. 
And we also then confirm that those pure systems are actually also still capable of expressing other proteins by doing additional uh, transfers of this regenerated pool into assays where we measured the GFP fluorescence and we could uh, confirm that those uh, regenerated pure systems still can make GFP. And that's something I will show you in the next slide with a slightly more complex system. Um, here we try to go for a, a, a more difficult um, um, target. And I think, you, I hope you remember this mass spectrometry bars from, um, from the PLD1 plasmid, which seem to be fairly okay in terms of uh, re-synthesis of the translation factors, at least as measured by mass spectrometry, because those translation factors are in, uh, only present at very low nanomolar concentration, at least most of them. So we, we hope maybe we can even regenerate some of these uh, 13 PLD uh, translation, uh, PLD1 proteins um, in, in one go, and then also do this here, transfer into new um, um, pure reactions where we omitted this entire a protein fraction from the PLD1 plasma. So 13 translation factors were missing. And the system could only maintain translation activity if it was able to synthesize those 13 translation factors by itself. And again, the same um, game as in the previous slide. So you have this generation one where you have synthesis um, of these translation factors which are encoded on this PLD1 plasmid. And then you dilute it in uh, presence of a control plasmid. In this case, it was PLD2, so a, a different plasmid which would not allow to compensate for these missing translation factors. And what would happen is that you slowly dilute out uh, the activity as well as the synthesis of these uh, translation factors. And if you have, however, the PLD1 plasmid present in your mixtures during serial transfer, it seems that you can maintain synthesis of the translation factors. Um, 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 up and running for at least three generations. And then again, to confirm that those translation factors that you made can participate in protein synthesis, we took 10% of this reaction and mixed it with a pure system again, which was missing all these proteins and expressing for GFP. And we found that after, you know, this is generation one, so you get a normalized GFP fluorescence of UF2. And then in the second generation where most of the PLD proteins had to be made by the system by itself. You still would get a decent amount of GFP um, synthesis. And then after the third generation, however, the system would collapse and you would lose the ability to make GFP. And in the control reactions, uh, uh, the collapse of GFP expression would, of course, happen much faster. So for at one or maybe one and a half generations, you can <laughs> push the system in a way that it can make uh, 13 of its own translation factors. Now, this was a very simple study, and, and there have been our papers out from other groups which do this uh, much more elegantly. Um, and also, there's a lot of challenges that remain, and one of them seems to be that uh, ribosomal processivity in pure systems is, is very um, uh, difficult to maintain. And this is a nice paper from the Daniel Law Lab, which just came out a couple of weeks back, where they used a fusion construct, or original fusion construct of this PLD constructs, uh, and looked at what, how well is the uh, expression of proteins from this uh, um, construct and how, how intact are those proteins. And what they indeed found is that a lot of these proteins are C-terminally truncated, and that's because the processivity of the pure system is very bad compared to the normal in vivo situation. So they say it's about five to 50 times more likely that your um, um, translation stops prematurely before you have reached the end of your, of your um, messenger RNA. And of course, this energy is wasted. You have made these peptides, but those peptides don't feed back into your system. And that's something that needs to be solved in order to, to, to build a self-regenerating system, because of course, you can't afford to waste a lot of energy when your synthesis yields are very poor from the start with. And, um, I also said that there's a, a nicer way of doing this serial transfer. This is another paper which came out late last year from the Merkel lab, where they did this continuous regeneration of up to seven pure proteins in a microfluidic reactor. So a kind of continuous, well, I think it's also stepwise, but an automated um, um, serial transfer 
um, reaction or zero dilution reaction where they can control for the different dilution efficient uh, uh, dif dif dilution numbers depending on what type of protein uh, of type of macromolecule it is. So you have different dilutions for DNA, proteins, and energy. And you can play around with those different uh, um, dilution, dilution strength. And they did very nice quantifications of that system and could uh, work out a lot of uh, details what, what would be required to build a self regenerating system. And they found one of the things they found is that the range of DNA concentrations that gives uh, high, uh, rise to high yields and high robustness of your uh, self regenerating system seem to be quite narrow because if you have too much of your template, you feed too much energy into making the system that uh, the, the protein that is missing. And if you have too little, you don't make enough of the protein that is required to maintain your activity. And at some point we have to deal with the situation that we need a, a very good uh, uh, level of feedback regulation on self-regenerating pure systems, um, the more translation factors we add, which is of course something we also find in modern biology. So feedback regulation, in particular for pure systems where you, uh, the, the yields and also the resources you have available are very scarce, uh, seem to be very important. Um, and I think, I don't know how much time I spent, or already 40 minutes, so I think I come to an end here. Um, I hope I could show you that long DNA genomes can be replicated by this TTCDR reaction, um, and um, that also proteins are expressed during the replication. Um, some of them also in amounts that seem to be sufficient to feed back into the system uh, if those uh, pure proteins are pure proteins and keep it alive for a little bit longer. <clears throat> um, so pure proteins can be re regenerated, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be uh, done. And as I could maybe show you from, from the, also the previous slides, but it was nice work by these other people. So of course, uh, it's always an issue the poor yields of the pure system. So roughly we probably re need like 20 to 30 times better pure systems to make at least 50% of the pure system. Uh, that's all of the pure proteins. That is what, what the um, Merkel lab uh, sort of said in their study, which is probably something I would also say roughly like one or two orders of magnitude seem to be necessary to make meaningful amounts. Then ribosome processivity seems to be an issue that needs to be resolved. So there might be uh, ways of doing that by adding ribosome rescue factors or uh, other E. coli proteins that uh, help to resolve this issue. But of course, then you make the, complex, the system more complex and then you have more proteins to synthesize. It's always a bit of a, of a difficulty. So that's the sweet spot of complexity of your pure system and still having a sufficient amount of, of uh, protein yields that can be made. And of course, at some point we need to deal with feedback control and expression levels and transcriptional and translational regulation and so on. And ribosome biogenesis and tRNA uh, synthesis is of course uh, another big chunk and a big topic, but uh, that's something uh, other groups of course are much better at. And I think that's also something that still requires some um, much more work in the future. But I'm kind of hopeful that we will be able at some point to build a, you know, something that resembles uh, uh, one of these very simple endosymbionts in, in insect cells, just that, you know, the insect cell will be us. So we will be feeding all the things that are missing and the, this, this simple symbiont can remain alive uh, by, by our assistance. And then maybe on down the road, uh, it will become more and more independent. Maybe we, at some point we also need to add some uh, evolution, evolutionary capacity to system because I think all of these things cannot be optimized by hand. Maybe machine learning might help, but I think also evolution might be necessary. Um, exactly. And I also don't think that you necessarily have to, you know, build this in small compartments with one clonal uh, genome, but you know, there's even examples from nature that a huge cytosol with many different uh, uh, nuclei can actually bring you quite fast. It is xenophorus. Uh, uh, I should have practiced that. It's a single giant cell of 20 centimeters and it's uh, doing actually quite well. Um, so I think that's also 
something, a lesson for us to learn that maybe, you know, we don't need to go for micrometer sized, small uh, lipid encapsulated uh, cell like entities. And I'm already at the end. So um, most of the work here was done by, by Kai, um, who uh, finished his uh, PhD 1st of March and is now, uh, unfortunately has left academia to work in, in, to uh, follow other challenges in, in, in real life. Um, and now the, the project is continued by Jacopo, uh, who recently joined the lab. And um, also like to thank um, um, Renate, who helped a, a lot with the qPCR, and of course, in, in the entire MULAB for, for this fantastic uh, work environment we have there, and Max in Bio for funding, and you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. I'm looking forward to the discussion. <clears throat> Thank, thank you very much. That was an awesome talk. You have a few questions in chat that I see already. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So I, I'm, I'm supposed to read and answer them. Okay. Uh, so yeah, if you could read them for people that yeah. will watch the recording, that would be great. Okay. So Eleonora Andrews, Andrews asks, could you do this replication experiment in whole cell bacteria TXTL instead of impure? Yeah. A good question, and I think Kai has tried in the beginning, and we always lost our template DNA. And we believe back then it's because of nucleases in the cytosol, they would just, or in the, in the lysate, they would just kill our, our DNA uh, products or templates immediately. And it also looked very messy on the gel, to be honest. So we were not really sure whether we got replication or not. Um, but I'm not saying it's probably not possible, but you need to maybe have you know, first to uh, figure out ways in that, that, you know, maybe might inhibit your nucleases so using lysate from a nuclease deficient strain or, I don't know, we, we didn't follow it up anymore because uh, it was, it, it didn't work very well in our hands, but it might be possible, um, but it yeah, might, might require some fine tuning. Okay, Petra asks, how far do you think are we from control of genome replication for synthetic cells? Not replicating the whole genome at once, but selective genes. Hmm, that's a good question. So with the system we have at the moment, you know, we are relying on random replication events, which seem to be driven by the presence of RNAs. At least that's what we and the EGH lab believe that's what's driving uh, replication in, in our schemes. Um, the Daniel lab, however, they are using the natural Phi 29 DNA replication machinery for, for their nice studies of DNA replication in liposomes. And here the DNA is replicated by protein, or each, uh, DNA replication is initiated by protein primers. Um, and if you had a way of controlling how well your protein primers might bind to your free DNA ends, or termini, you might get a way of, of controlling a replication of different genes, but then you would need a lot of fragmented genes. So maybe you're not meaning genome replication, but transcription. Um, there you could, of course, you know, either use existing transcription regulation systems, which there's plenty of in bacteria, or you could at least uh, play around with expression, expression strengths using different T7 promoters. But um, not replicating the whole genome, I think it's possible, but it requires a lot of tinkering. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do it. Um, so Howard asked, Howard Anderson asked, could you please speculate about the evolutionary capacities? How would you go about that? So um, here again, the ETH lab has published something very nice recently where they did uh, evolution of the 529 DNA polymerase using exactly that system. And what they did, they encapsulated uh, the reactions in emulsion droplets. And then you, what you do is you do rounds of replication in those droplets, then you pool what you have, and then you redistribute it in new droplets. And uh, by that you have an automatic selection pressure towards higher uh, uh, replication capacity. And I think you could, and what they managed to, to, to find is, I think that they managed to find some uh, mutations, I don't know, in the polymerase or maybe in the template that would confer a higher replication rate. 
And of course, you could have a similar Darwinian feedback on, on your system. If you say like, I put in a, a enzyme which, um, which helps in regenerating DNTPs. And if, if this is a cargo gene of your genome and uh, you would only get this regeneration working if your replicase is, or DNA polymerase is doing a good job, um, then you would have an automatic selection for uh, uh, genomes in a droplet that would have a high activity in regenerating these DNTPs and you would accumulate them over time. So it's, you know, very basic uh, by, um, um, evolution, like something we also see for viruses. If you can make more of your template, then you win eventually the race. And whenever you have a feedback of whatever enzyme you have on your genome on replication efficiency, I think you're in business. Um, so thanks, Orkan. Um, and then a question from Isaac. Um, do you know of any attempts to optimize the system with machine learning so far? Um, so far, we don't know yet, but we are thinking about those. <laughs> Maybe another time. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's, you know, it's a multi-parameter issue, uh, which is, you know, it's, it's a, a parameter space which is very difficult to traverse with, with two hands that kind of pipettes or maybe a machine learning algorithm will do a much better job. And that's something we're also hoping for. There's a lot of power for, for Symbio in machine learning. Edward Baim asks, what would be genome replication mechanism for origin of lifestyle early cells? Um, also polymers like FAT29 or some other mechanism. I think for well, it depends on how, where, where you, <laughs> which part of origin of life you're talking about. I mean, probably, you know, the most famous hypothesis uh, out there is the RNA world hypothesis, even though it's getting, uh, you know, um, more and more, uh, there's more and more evidence that it might have been not, not as simple as we think, so a simple ribozyme that would just replicate itself. Um, I think there must have been a way of, of, of efficient replication before, replication before we had the ability to make enzymes like Phi29, because to make Phi29, you of course need a, a ribosome and making ribosomes is just a, a nightmare, at least for a bottom-up symbio person like me. So there must be simpler ways. And the only way I could think of is either non-enzymatic replication or uh, nucleic acid catalyzed replication may be assisted by some other um, cofactors or, or simple peptides. Um, but I think with proteins, not at the beginning. It's just, I think it's not possible because you had no access to proteins. So I would say it must have been probably nucleic acid enzymes and some that, that had some help from, from other uh, polymers, for example. On slide 17, oh, I don't know what was on slide 17. You showed the concentration of regenerated proteins very widely from that of pure system. How well can you tune the expression of proteins, promoters, ribosome binding site, gene duplication? I think that's a very good question. So yes, I think you can play around with it a lot by having a weaker or stronger ribosome binding site, uh, a stronger weaker T7 promoter. So there's also options to do this. I think there's a lot of potential to optimize that. And you know, you could take away some of the resources for the proteins that get regenerated tenfold compared to one that only gets regenerated by you know ten percent. So it, there's a lot of things you can optimize in that system. So we only had this brute force approach by uh, by using the expression plasmids that are thought that, you know that are supposed to work when you overexpress the proteins in your E. coli and not in pure systems. And I think, yes, you need to do a lot of tweaking to get expression, live, uh, uh, ex expression right for pure systems. And there's a lot of potential here that we can redistribute or reallocate uh, the resources towards these poorly expressing proteins. However, I think the issue will still be that you can't make proteins that require high micromolar amounts simply because the pure system at the moment is not good enough, so we need much better pure systems. The, the, the dream would be to have a pure system which is maybe as good as the current lysate-based systems, but maybe the lysate-based systems are only so good because they're complex and based on lysate. I don't know. Um, also, to, for the last question, um, 
I don't know. I can't really. So the question is, what, how, how difficult would it be to create a system that is a, an approximately regenerative protein, uh, approximately reg, uh, regenerative protein concentration wise? I think for that, we first need to know how much we need for each protein. That's another thing you need to figure out first. Do we need five or 50 nanomolars of this specific tRNA synthetase? What's enough? And I think we don't know yet. So I think when the pure systems were mixed for the first time, I don't know if every component was optimized. I can't believe that because it's, I think, to optimize uh, 30 translation factors in parallel might be might be a daunting task. Um, I guess they, maybe they did some rough titrations and then found like, oh, 10 nanomolar is enough of this protein, so let's stick with that. Um, but it was shown now repeatedly that if you ramp up the concentration of a lot of translation factors, you also get higher yields. And again, it comes down, you need to find a sweet spot for each of the translation factors or for each of the protein components. And I guess here again, a solution might be that this is not done by humans, but Silicon friends. Um, Yanis Ntekas asks, do you think that the self-replicating DNA potential in pure systems could be harnessed for optimal, optimal evolution and production? Yeah, I think you can also do this. Uh, you don't need to do this in pure. Well, you could do it in pure because then selection might be easier. Yeah, I mean, if you're okay with using your optimal at conditions that are compatible with the pure system, I think this could be straightforward. Again, you need a feedback mechanism of that your aptima, um, you know, helps selection for your, for your DNA. And this would be that you, you know, you, you take your DNA and the aptima, you somehow need to, uh, depends on whether you're talking about RNA or DNA aptimus. For RNA aptimus, it's a bit more difficult because the RNA floats away. Yeah, but, you know, give me an hour and we could come up with an idea. I think it's possible, but as long as you have genotype, phenotype coupling, you can select for anything. Darren Betts Johnson asks, uh, can you control how many copies are made of the genome or phi-29 just keeps going? Yes, at the moment, very primitive system, phi-29 just keeps on going until there's no DNTPs left or until it's dead. So we know that it keeps on going long after the pure system has stopped working. So it's just much more robust. And uh, we know Phi29 is a very processive enzyme. Um, so it's a beast. And yes, to control it, uh, good question. We would need something that blocks it uh, from, from further rounds of floating cell replication. But we haven't looked into this yet. Chiara Gandini, hello, how are you doing? <laughs> we know each other. Do you think uh, RNA routing circle could streamline the process? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. There's RNA routing circle replication, I think, in some uh, plant viruses, right? Uh, or satellite RNAs. I think what, it is a very appealing um, method. It's, I think it was always difficult, at least from, from, from the... Um, from my perspective as a simple microbiologist is that for this viral, uh, for this parasitic RNAs from plants, I think you need a normal uh, plant RNA polymerase, right? And those are huge machines. Um, so you would have a lot of genes to encode on your RNA genome, which would then have to be translated by a eukaryotic translation machinery. And I'm, I've no, I don't know much about <laughs> eukaryotic translation, a vitro translation systems, of course, I know it once you can buy the wheat germ and so on, but so far I don't know of any eukaryotic pure system that would be cool though. <laughs> yeah, but it's a cool idea. I mean, I, I like systems that only work based on RNA alone. We also have looked into this, um, but I think there's some reasons why nature at some point picked DNA instead of RNA, at least for long genomes, because it's not very easy to replicate hundreds of KB of, of RNA. <clears throat> okay, I think that's it so far. I, I think that's it. You basically gave a second talk answering questions. Okay, okay. 20 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Forgot about time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, to be mindful of time, we're up to the hours. So um, if anyone has any other questions, they know how to find you. Okay. I have some questions, but I owe you an email anyway, so you 
hear from yeah, me. I hope you got it to work, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot for, for your attention. Thanks a lot for listening. And hopefully see you another time again. And then there will be more on Origin of Life, hopefully. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And take care. Take care. Bye. Bye.